from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Eleanor Oldroyd in frosty London today. It feels very cold it feels very midwinter. It feels a very, very long way from the cricket season here. And I'm thoroughly jealous of uh, our usual host, Alison Mitchell, who is enjoying the sunshine in Melbourne at the Australian Open Tennis. But I am extremely jealous of all of you. And I'm particularly looking forward to the Border Gavaskar Trophy, which is just round the corner uh, for Australia and India. But uh, Jim, that's something I'm sure you look, you're looking forward to as well. Yes, it should be a contest and that'll be Something to look forward to. Um, it's Jim Maxwell for the ABC up here on the central coast, just north of Sydney. And over my shoulder, you can probably see the Pacific Ocean, perhaps not the beach, but it's a nice spot to be, even though one day it's 32 degrees and the next about 19 and pouring with rain. But that's what you get if you live anywhere near Sydney in the last 12 months. We know how to do rain very, very well. And I'm Sunil Gupta for All India Radio, not in New Delhi this time, but in sunny Jaipur, sunny and cold, for the Jaipur Literature Festival, because I have, as you all know, a literary streak in me besides all the cricket that I listen and I, I talk about. And yes, Jim, and yes, uh, Ellie, we are absolutely looking forward to the Border Gavaskar Trophy that's coming up next month. And I'll tell you, that is going to be a cracker of a series. But I think we're going to have some sporting pitches and we're going to actually see whether those... Uh, Wins that we pulled off against Australia in Australia, I'm reminding Jim, were flukes or the real thing. If it's anything like that series, it's going to be an absolute thriller. We will look ahead to that. We'll talk about India and Australia a little bit later in the show. But first, it's all change at the top of South Africa's coaching setup. Two big appointments as they try to recover from what was a disappointing 2022. Since Mark Boucher's resignation as their men's red and white ball coach after last year's T20 World Cup, Cricket South Africa has split the role into two. Rob Walter will take charge of the white ball team and the new red ball coach is Shukri Conrad and I'm delighted to say he joins us on Stumped now. Shukri, welcome to Stumped. Congratulations first of all. What does this mean to you? What does it mean to your family? Yeah, uh, good day Eli and thanks for having me. Um, look, as the cliche go, it's an honour and a privilege but it is exactly that. It is a massive honour for me. I've been coaching domestically in South Africa for nigh on 20 years now and my family, we, we're a cricket family. Uh, we're a very closely knit family. And they're over the moon. Um, even my daughter, who, who resides in Liverpool now, she uh, messaged me the other day and says, well, she's going to be supporting the Proteas as well now. Well, that's great to hear. And South Africa, of course, were, were over here last summer and didn't have the best as England went through their extraordinary turnaround. But this is a pivotal time, really, for Test cricket in your country, isn't there? Because there's a lot of focus on the shorter forms of the game. There's been a lot of resources poured into the new um, SA20 league as well. So do you have to kind of almost sell test cricket all over again to South Africa? Uh, I think not, uh, Ellie. I think our best players, all our top internationals still want to play test cricket. Um, and, and that for me is, the, is the, 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 the thing that's going to take us forward here. Yes, the T20 League and the SA20 League, which has been an unprecedented success, obviously is very lucrative and, and everybody wants a piece of that pie. But ultimately, our top players still want to play test cricket and they want to be part of this new era, for want of a, a better phrase. Um, so I'm very confident that, but I'm also under no illusion that it is going to be a monumental task turning this around. Um, especially on the batting front. I, I think we, um, we've let ourselves down in, in, in the last 12 months, both in England and in, in, in Australia on the batting front. So that for me would be uh, a massive focus uh, as we sit right now. Shukri, Jim Maxwell, congratulations to you. Uh, having watched South Africa here in Australia, how do you go about uh, remedying the situation? And what about the confidence the players, uh, it must be a, a bit of a low at the moment. Yeah, yeah, definitely a bit of a low. Um, the good part, if I can just mention this, I, I've worked at National Academy level, so I know pretty much everybody's come through the National Academy at some stage, so I know the characters, I know the, the abilities. Um, but it's 
I don't think our issue only lie at test match level. Um, our first class system needs revisiting and re-looking at. Currently, we have a first class system that is seven first class matches long in terms of the four day game. And, and that's not enough, but it's also not a, a pressured enough environment. So I think we've got to be quite novel uh, when we look at our, our first class system and our, and our first class fixtures for next year, how we, how we create a, a slightly more pressured environment for our players. Because that, that gap between international and first class is, is getting ever wider. Um, so how do, I, how do we fix it in the short term? Uh, we, we obviously need to look at the guys that are in form, guys that have performed at the levels that they're expected to. And ultimately, the currency remains runs. Eh? You, you can bandy all the fancy words about and, and, and philosophies and uh, mantras and all of, all of the above. But ultimately, you want the guys on the field that have been performing at the level that they were selected at. You mentioned the word currency, and I would think that is a problem for cricket South Africa, given the T20 formats and how attractive they are to your players. Um, how will you be able to work on the contracts to make sure that you can keep players to play test cricket. Yeah, look, we 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 inheriting or I'm inheriting a system where our contract periods end end of April, I think it is, where they're going to be guys that are still on a rollover or second year of a two year contract when I when I take over. Um, but I cannot be held. I don't think any of us can be held to a contract only. Obviously, conversations need to be had with said players. But I also think globally, Jim, if, if one looks at and, I, and I, <laughs> we've got to admire what England have done in terms of their test side, I think globally the, 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 the transition is not such a big one from T20 into test cricket anymore. And I certainly don't want, I don't feel that the two formats are as far apart and far removed as they possibly were a couple of years ago. So we find a lot of top players transitioning from T20 cricket into test cricket. And whilst the lure of, of representing your country at the highest level is still there, I think players are going to be hungry for that. Can you tell us something about the goals you've set for the bowlers? I mean, you have some of the best bowlers in the world. Jim was remarking about them. Rabada and Nocha and, everybody, and, and Janssen, who bowled so well against India when he made his debut. I said, Elia, yeah, I think we've got a fabulous bunch of fast bowlers. We mentioned all the fast bowlers there, which has always been a strength of South Africa. When you're not scoring runs, you've got to do both facets well. You've got to bat really well, and then obviously you've got to bowl well. But I think it, it, it can become quite a, a draining exercise when as a bowler, you walk out, you, you come off the field, having done your bit, you want a bit of feet up and almost rest for the day. And a couple of hours later, you find yourself back on the park again, you know. And when you bowl to few runs, it, it becomes very difficult. You can't carry the extra catcher. You can't set the fields particularly you want, so you've got to marry the attacking and the defensive stuff. So that can have an effect on on, our, on the bowling group as well. I cannot speak for for what the bowlers went through there, but sitting here where I was um, and knowing the little bit I know about the game is that when you've got runs, I think you generally get the best out of your bowlers. And similarly, as a batter, when, you, when you're blowing teams away, I think your batters get confidence from that as well. Finally, about the leaders um, in your team, um, Dean Elgar is 35, didn't have the best series in Australia. Temba Bavuma is 32. Uh, would that be one of the parts of your building block going forward for South Africa? Um, yes, that's something I'm going to be looking at. Uh, and I like the word leader you use rather than captain because I think they, they, they're slightly different. I think we find really good captains I think South Africa is, is needing leadership at the moment. If Dean is still the, the right person as it stands right now, he is the current South African test captain. So I'll, I'll obviously be engaging and connecting with Dean soon, um, find out exactly where he's at. Um, and then obviously start also looking towards the future when we start implementing, if it's new leadership we need, when we do that. Uh, look, I, th I think you also don't want to come in and just with a scattergun approach and just start firing left, right and center and hope that one or two hit the target. You know, you, you, you've got to be very strategic in this. And, and I'm very comfortable that. And maybe it's not a bad thing that we don't play so many tests right now for me personally to get things right uh, uh, in, the short, in the short term. Um, so leadership is definitely something, Sunil, that 
that um, that I'm going to be looking at, yes. Well, Shukri, we wish you all the very best of luck in your new role. Lots of challenges lying ahead, as you've outlined for us here on Stumps, and uh, we can't wait to see how you get on. Thanks ever so much, Ellie. I really appreciate the support, and thanks for having me. Well, next on Stumped, we want to talk about Shubman Gill. He has become the youngest man to score a double century in a one-day international. The 23-year-old hit 208 as India won their first ODI with New Zealand in Hyderabad by 12 runs. Now, Sona, it feels like a while we've been talking about Shubman Gill. He's been a bit of had a bit of pressure on his shoulders, hasn't he, to perform? But he has really shown now how good he can be and the way he reached that double century as well with three sixes in a row. I think he has the gift of timing, something that Rohit Sharma has, and he's been able to put it to, uh, you know, and, and he was spotted really early. He made his mark, as you remember, in the Australia series when India were there in 2021 and scored that magnificent 91 at the Gabatois, which India won and broke that record from Australia. But uh, he has class. He has class. You could see it in his strokes. You can see the way that even in the, uh, in the, in the game yesterday, the way that he was caressing the ball, right, even if he was caressing it over the boundary, there was no wild hitting. There was really, you know, it was scientific hitting. And I think he has a long way to go. And I, I compliment the selectors and the captain for keeping their faith in him because Ishan Kishan had scored a double century, if you remember, against uh, Bangladesh in one of the earlier ODIs. And there was a lot of pressure on them to include Ishan Kishan at the top of the order, but they stuck with Shubman Gay. You st- if you stick with class, Class is going to repay you. So they're, they're right in the midst of another white ball series, having just come off the back of a record-breaking win against Sri Lanka in the one-day international there. Uh, 390 for five India were at the end of their 50 overs before bowling Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka out for a measly 73 in just 22 overs. Now, the former England captain, Michael Vaughan, summed it up on Twitter saying, in my era, if you scored 275, it was deemed a big ODI score. India have just won by 317 um, with a 50 over World Cup coming up in India later this year. Uh, Jim, it, I mean, the rest of the world will look at this and quake in their boots, I suspect. But but I mean, it is a remarkable win, however you look at it for India. Yes. And I think we were seeing more big scores in 50 over cricket, uh, but more so because there's more of it in T20 cricket. I mean, just the other day, Steve Smith scored 100 in a T20 game with seven sixes off 56 balls. So um, the, fr- the the frequency, rapidity, uh, the, the the boldness uh, of the batting uh, is just becoming more commonplace. And on easy pitches, um, well, it wasn't so easy for Sri Lanka. It seems like they gave up the ghost when they got their chance to bat. But um, we're going to see more of, of this because... Uh, batsmen are clearing the pickets or clearing the boundary more often. And, and they're, they're playing the game with a, a confidence uh, we have not seen before. And it's carrying over into test cricket, which is why um, test cricket's become even more attractive, particularly the way Ben Stokes and uh, McCallum have been the leading the England side. So the beneficiary uh, of all of this is uh, the spectacle. And, uh, it's not such a good one for the bowlers, mind you, but um, for most most of the fans who go out to the ball game, they want to see the ball hit over the fence uh, or into the stand, and that's what we're getting. Um, so look forward to more of it, I reckon. Well, let's talk about the Bolder Gavaskar Trophy. The, the squads have been announced on both sides this week. Um, still no Jasper at Bumrah for, for India, Sunil, which, of course, is a, is a big blow still. He's been out for a, a while with injury, but... Bit of a shock that Safras Khan has been left out again. Yes, um, you know, he doesn't look the quintessential languid, graced batsman. He's short and chubby, a little bit like, let's say, David Boone. But David Boone, we all know what he was capable of. And this boy has been 982 runs at an average of 122, just under the great Sir Donald Bradman. But, but, and there's always a but, uh, when he played the three uh, India A games, um, last year, I think it was, his average was only 33. And he scored 99-odd runs in three test matches. So it, it's, I think it's that little step up to the next level that uh, the selectors are worried about. I saw him play uh, a magnificent innings for Mumbai against uh, Delhi in the Ranji Trophy, and Mumbai were down and out. And he came up and scored a century and took them to about 300. 
So he has, and I saw him play, and he has some absolutely beautiful shots. He had all the time in the world to play those shots. I think his time will come. Uh, I think he's just got to put those runs on the board as, indeed, look at Sky, Surikant uh, Yadav. He's been on the fringes for so long, came in, made a bang, and now he's there. He came in in the 30s. So I think there's plenty of time for Sarfraz to make a mark. And Jim, a word on the Aussie squad. Um, four spinners included, but but none of them is Adam Zampa. And I, I know that he's not terribly happy about that. He's been talking about it. But, but what do you think of the squad as a whole? Well, Australia is playing with a lot of confidence and a lot of skill. Um, and in fact, uh, their best bowling attack will be Nathan Lyon and three quicks. And that'll apply in India unless the pitch looks like a Bunsen burner from day one which it might on a few occasions. Um, and remembering that Australia has a backup of uh, fellows like Travis Head, Lavis Shannon Smith, not frontline bowlers, but uh, they can add some variety there. And they might be better off going with that kind of balance other than playing a spinner uh, who lacks skill and experience at this level. So when Australia last won in India in 2004, it was their pace bowlers that did it in Nagpur. You might remember that game where Ganguly cried off at the last minute because they yes, put a bit of, yes. left a bit of grass on the pitch. He didn't <laughs> didn't fancy that. Well, he was quite right in not fancying it because England uh, India went went down. Um, so I, I think uh, Australia will fancy their chances against India if they can win the toss and bat more often than lose it and have India batting. Uh, the toss will be a big factor. And another big factor we should mention here, of course, is uh, the absence of uh, Rishabh Pant uh, with you know, that unfortunate motor accident he had. He'll be a huge loss, I would have thought, uh, Sunil, for, for Indy because he he's a game changer. He can bat for an hour and change the course of a match, and he's done that on a number of occasions. So can they cover his absence? That will be interesting to watch. I mean, somebody's misfortune is somebody's opportunity. You know, and somebody's got to grab it and take it. And he made his opportunity when he came in. Nobody gave him a chance. You know, the fast, bouncy Australian pitches and how he played. I still remember that magnificent innings at the Gabba. It was outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And as Jim said, the game changer. Well, here's a chance for somebody to step up. Why not? Very well put, Sunil and Jim, as always, cutting to the heart of the story. Um, really great to see you both. Have a wonderful time. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you on Stumped today. Uh, thank you to Jim Maxwell and to Sunil Gupta. And don't forget to join us again next time. Bye for now. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.